Okay, so today we're going to be covering the last chapter in Accounting 2302. So today we will be getting into some finance type information. Um, so up until this point, we've been really focused with a lot of accounting. Of course, that would make sense. Um, and, and we still are to some extent in this chapter, but, but here we're going to start pulling in a lot of those finance ideas that you'll see when you actually start taking your finance courses. Um, that's why this chapter right here is primarily why they want you normally to have taken managerial accounting before you get into your first finance because this chapter has a lot of overlap with some of those introductory ideas that you'll cover in there. So this will help you um, not only do well on your fourth exam in here or that last exam in here, depending on how the course is structured this semester and that final, um, but it will also help you in your finance courses as well. So let's go ahead and get started. So the very first thing that we want to look at here in chapter 24 is this idea of capital budgeting. What is this? Do we need it? What does it mean? How does it work? All those types of things we're going to be dealing with here. So the first thing we have to understand is that capital budgeting is just a process. And it is the process that we use to analyze alternative long-term investments. This also helps us decide when do we buy an asset, when do we sell an asset, all that type of stuff. Anything dealing with these long-term items tends to be what we consider part of capital budgeting. Now, capital budgeting process typically looks something like this, although it may not be exactly this process, you know, or said exactly like this at each organization, but you'll normally see some general aspects that are the same. So the first thing here is that we will have a department or plant manager. Somebody will generate a request or a proposal for this new piece of machinery, this new item that we need. Then a budget committee over these capital budget type decisions will have to actually evaluate that proposal. And then of course, at the end of this, the board of directors will approve that capital expenditure or of course deny that capital expenditure. Now, the issue here with capital budgeting is this isn't something that we can normally decide very quickly, right? This isn't something where I say, okay, yeah, let's go do that today. This might be something that spans a significant period of time. So for example, I might be deciding to open a new facility in an area that I've never operated in before. Well, that capital investment decision might take 10 or 15 years to really play out. Well, the issue is, of course, the world can change a lot in that amount of time. So is this still going to be a good decision at that point? Well, that's kind of the problem that we have. And because of this, these decisions require a careful analysis because they tend to be noticed the most difficult and risky. Specifically, these decisions are risky for several reasons. Um, one of these reasons is we don't know what the outcome will actually be, right? I mean, this could go fantastically and we could turn out really well here, or this could go really, really badly, but we just don't know. Second, this is not typically something that involves a few dollars, right? This might be a $400, $500 million decision that we're making as to if we actually want to create a storefront or if we actually want to invest all these assets in this new facility in another country or anything along those lines. So very high dollar decisions being made here. Also, this typically will involve a long-term commitment. So this isn't something I'm going to get into if I only plan to be there for six months or a year. If I'm going to do this, I'm probably wanting to be there for maybe 15, 20, 50 years, right? A long period of time. And of course, once I go into this decision, I probably can't really come back out of it. And so it's going to be very difficult to reverse course if this starts to go wrong. So these decisions have to be made very, very carefully because the implications, if they are not made carefully, can be very, very drastic and very, very dire for our organization. So we have to be very careful. Now, the idea here is with my capital budgeting, we're looking at not only the cash that we have to pay, but of course the cash that we will receive. So there are some initial or just some general types of cash flows that we will see, of course, at the beginning, we will have to actually pay something up front. This is what we call the initial cash outflow. This is a negative, right? So this is me deciding to actually invest $300 million in another country, right? Well, that 300 million that I'm having to spend right now, that is an initial cash outflow. That is for that acquisition. Then of course, we will use some cash. 
And so we'll use the cash in the general operations, but hopefully during this period of time, we'll actually be generating the inflows, right? This will be when we finally have the actual machine up and running. We have the facility up and running. We are doing business now. We are now able to generate this cash inflow. This is when we're really bringing in the money. Then at the end, of course, we will dispose of this and we will get one final cash inflow from this disposal, typically at the salvage value. Now, in, in truth, right, that salvage value may not be exactly what we expected it to be at the beginning of this whole process. So now maybe 20, 25 years down the line, salvage may be very different than what we initially expected, but we will still see that salvage coming in there at the end. Now, you might say, well, how do we determine this, right? How do I determine if I've got a profitable uh, project or one worth pursuing? And so the issue here is you don't really know um, unless you do some analysis, but that's what we're going to look at in this chapter is how we answer that question and how we can make this decision. But we'll notice there are quite a few methods and each method has its own specific strengths and weaknesses that we'll need to consider. So the idea being, it's probably not a bad idea to go ahead and look at a few of these as you start making these decisions in practice. Now, the most common and by far the most simple to calculate is what is called my payback period. The problem with payback period though is that it has a lot of problems. Um, payback period in being so simple neglects to take into consideration a lot of different things that we should probably be considering. So for example, and we'll get into some of these in a second, but the idea is all I'm looking at is how long it takes me to recover that initial investment when I'm looking at payback period. So as soon as I collect that initial investment and I bring that back in, well now anything that happens after that point is effectively ignored. This also means that if I'm only looking at when the cash comes back, I'm not looking at the time value of money. So I'm not recognizing that a dollar received six years from today, for example, is worth less than a dollar received today. So there are a lot of problems here with payback period, but payback period is just the amount of time it takes a project to recover its initial amount of the investment. Now, the reason I say this one's very common is you hear this all the time. And if you ever watch shows like Shark Tank or anything else like that, it's very common for them to mention, well, I need my money back in three years, or I need my money back in two and a half years or four years, whatever that is. But they're essentially saying that is the payback period that they're setting. Now, in truth, right, it's not a great way to make a decision. All it tells you is that's how long it takes you to get back your money in nominal terms, but it doesn't tell you if you're actually generating a return. It doesn't tell you if this is actually a good long-term investment. It just says, yeah, here's your money back. So payback period, very simple. We like it and we'll see how that works um, now. So payback period, as you would expect, we're gonna calculate this, of course, by taking the actual initial cost of that investment divided by the annual net cash flow. Now. If I am using payback period to make a decision, generally we want this to be a low number. So the sooner I get my cash back, the better, All right? That's the general idea here. So if it costs me a million dollars to get into this investment and I'm able to generate annual net cash flow of $400,000, then I'll hit payback in two and a half years, right? And so that's not perhaps very bad. But if I'm only able to generate $50,000 in, in, in annual net cash flow, well, now it's gonna take me 20 years to recover that initial cash investment. That may be significantly longer than I'm really wanting to be, in, to be involved in this. So in that case, you would want your payback period very, very short, right? As soon as we can get our money back, the better. So our first situation here involves payback period with even cash flows. So fast track is considering buying a new machine, cost of 16,000, life eight years, no salvage. Notice they tell me we expect to produce a total of 30,000 units over this thing's life. And we have a product selling price per unit of $30. And they want us to calculate the payback period. Well, my cost of my initial investment divided by my annual net cash flow. In this case, my payback period is going to be the $16,000. And then we will come in 
and divide by my annual net cash flow. Now this $4,100, with the information we have in the PowerPoint, we're not able to actually calculate. Um, this is given to you in the book, I believe it's page 949. Um, if this is still the, let's see what, what edition we're using here. This is the eighth edition. So if you're still using the eighth edition when you take this class, I believe that is on page 949. And so in this case, it kind of gives you that breakdown and shows you how they got that $4,100, but this is what we're seeing. At that point, you're just gonna take the 16,000 divided by that 4,100, and that will give you your payback period here of just under four years. Now, that one was pretty easy because we had nice even cash flows. The problem becomes when we have uneven cash flows. Uneven cash flows are a little bit different. So let's see how this works. In this case, I assume we want to install a machine. Once again, initial cost of 16. Has an eight year useful life this time though with zero salvage. And they tell us here annual net cash flows are, so we notice in year zero, right? Whenever we first buy this thing, and let me grab my pen here. So let me grab that. So here in year zero, my expected net cash flows, right, is just this negative $16,000. And that makes sense to us because all we're seeing in year zero, right, is the actual purchase of the machine. Now, in year one, we're expected to generate net cash flows, right, in the positive direction here, $3,000. Now, at that point in time, then, my cumulative net cash flows are still negative. In this case, now only negative 13. So this is my negative 16 plus my 3,000. So I'm down to negative 13. And we'll continue this trend all the way down. And we're looking for the point at which my cumulative net cash flows switch from negative to positive. And that is the key here, from negative to positive. So in this case, we can see that I switch at the end of year four, right? I still had a negative cash cumulative flow of $1,000. So I'm still negative. But then in year five, I'm now positive. So we know that the payback period here is a minimum of four years, right? Four entire full years have to pass. Then we need a portion, a portion of the cash flows from year five. So the way that we're going to do this is we're going to come in and find, in this case, my $1,000 that I still need to cover divided by my total annual cash flow from the next period. That next period is $5,000. When I come in and I take one divided by five, what I'll come out to then is 0.2. So I will need four full years plus 0.2 additional years or plus two tenths of another year. So the assumption that we're making here is that we generate these cash flows evenly over the year. So I'm not told that my sales are 80% in January and February and 20% over the rest of the 10 months, right? We have a very heavy front end type of situation. No, we're assuming here that I generate this cash flow very evenly throughout the year, right? So in that case, I would need 20% of year five. So I would need four full years plus two tenths of the next year to achieve payback in this case. Now, for our next piece then, what we want to realize is that now payback strength or payback period has actually two strengths that we do like. The one that I always like to start with is that it's very easy, right? You've seen that. It's not the most complicated thing in the world. It's pretty straightforward. It just pulls in these two numbers and we do a little bit of division. Now, the good news here too, is that this actually uses cash flow, not income. So cash flow, Right, that can be a strength that we're looking at cash flow and not income, but it can also be a weakness. Um, so this is the, the one of the kind of interesting things with payback period is yes, it will tell me if I'm generating positive cash flow, which is great, but if I'm losing money, does that really matter in the end? Maybe not, right? But at the same time, it doesn't really matter if I generate a lot of net income if I'm not able to collect the cash. So there are strengths and weaknesses to both of that first point here. Now, there are some major weaknesses that we do have to address with payback period. Um, the first is this does not reflect the differences in the timing of near net cash flows. So it makes no distinction if that, you know, the majority of the cash flow happens in year one or happens in year three. It doesn't care, right? A dollar is a dollar. 
Um, it also ignores all cash flows occurring after the point where an investment's costs are fully recovered. So maybe in the first three years, it's taking you a little bit to really get going, but in that time, you actually do hit payback. Then in year four, you have a massive inflow of cash because you've really taken off. Well, that massive inflow of cash would cause you, if you were only looking at payback period, to possibly ignore that option and go for another project that never has that large payback later. Because as soon as we hit payback under payback period, nothing else counts. And then finally, of course, number three, which ties in fairly well to number one here in my weaknesses, is that we ignore time value of money. This is a major, major, major weakness. And it is why payback period is generally thought of as not a fantastic um, evaluation of these projects or of these investment decisions because we're not considering that time value of money. So very large weaknesses here with our payback period. Now, my next item that we want to look at is what is called my accounting rate of return. So with my accounting rate of return, this is essentially just the percentage accounting return we're able to generate on an annual average investment. And so that's really all we're looking at here. Now, the reason that we see the word accounting here is primarily because this is just looking at net income and not on cash flow. So we throw that word accounting in there just to try to tip us off that here we're not as concerned with the cash flows, we're more concerned with the actual income. So there's two ways in this case to calculate your annual average investment. Um, so the first here is to take beginning book value plus ending over two. Um, the second is to take the sum of the individual years average book values divided by the number of years of the planned investment. Um, the first one is just really for whenever we're dealing with straight line situations. Um, the second one can be used with anything. Um, and here, I believe we will be primarily focused on these straight line cases, though. Um, so we try to keep it a little bit more straightforward in here. But our general formula for accounting rate of return, annual after-tax net income divided by that annual average investment. And of course, down here at the bottom, you've got the two different ways to calculate that annual average investment. So what's my decision rule here? What am I looking for? Well, when I'm comparing investments with similar lives and risk, the company will prefer the investment with the highest accounting rate of return. So very good. Now, let's revisit that $16,000 investment that we're considering. In this case, they tell me the new machine has an annual after-tax net income of $2,100. And they want me to compute the accounting rate of return. Well, in this case, they told me there was no salvage value, so ending book value will be zero. So for my annual average investment, it's just my 16,000 over two, which is of course 8,000. Then for me to actually calculate my accounting rate of return, I'll take my $2,100 divided by my $8,000 in average assets. And in this case, that will come out to 26.25%. Now, accounting rate of return has some weaknesses that we have to look at. Um, you'll notice that first one, another very important one here, it ignores time value of money. Also, it focuses on income and not cash flows. Um, the problem here, of course, being it doesn't really matter, once again, how much income you generate if you don't have the cash. All right, at the end of the day, we have to be able to pay our bills and we pay our bills with cash. So we're going to have to consider that cash piece and the accounting rate of return just doesn't. Um, finally, if the income varies each year, this project will appear desirable in one year and not in another. Um, so it's fairly inconsistent. Now, if you have a good project that somehow generates very even income over its life, then that's not anything you have to worry about. But if I generate a lot of income in year one and then have a down year for year two and three, and then have a lot of income in year four and a lot of income in year five, and then back down in year six, you can see how this can turn into a really interesting situation with accounting rate of return because it's not going to give you a consistent answer on which project or which option to pursue. Now, my next option that we want to look at or my next um, method that we're going to look at is what is called net present value. Now, net present value is by far the best method that we are talking about here in this chapter. And it is the one that I generally will tell you if you can only really learn one of these things leaving out of this class. I think net present value is a really good one for you to learn and to really become familiar with because net present value is so common 
Um, whenever we really start making really high level decisions, this is the one that we really want to put our time into. So here we see that net present value analysis will apply. Notice the time value of money to future cash inflows and outflows so that we can evaluate our projects, benefits, and costs at a single point in time. So this is really important. So in this idea, we will calculate NPV or net present value by doing several things. One, we will discount the future net cash flows from the investment notice at the required rate of return. This is often called the hurdle rate. I think the hurdle rate is really descriptive here too, because if you imagine, say you're running on a track and you see the hurdles in front of you. Well, if you are able to clear the hurdle, you are successful. You are able to generate enough power, enough jumping ability to get over that hurdle. But if you do not jump well enough to get over that hurdle, you fall, you hurt yourself, you get tangled up in the hurdle, you're embarrassed, whatever it is, right? But it's not a good situation when you fail to clear that hurdle. Well, the same thing is true here, right? If I'm not able to generate a return in excess of that hurdle rate, it will be a bad decision, right? If I know I can't jump over that hurdle, I should probably not try, right? I should probably not pursue that because I'm, all I'm going to do is hurt myself. So the same thing is true here. If you're not able to generate a return in excess of that hurdle rate, you should not accept that project. And then of course, we will subtract the initial amount invested from the sum of what is called my discounted future cash flows. So let's see how this works. Well, in this case, we are told that fast track considering the purchase of a machine costing 16,000 at your useful life, zero salvage that promises annual net cash inflows of $4,100. We require a 12% return on our investments. So what we'll do is we will go actually have to discount this at a rate of 12%. So for year one, my present value factor discounted at 12% is 0.8929, giving me a present value of future cash flows in this case of 3661. We'll come down my table, pulling my present value percentages for each location. And we see that as I get further and further away from my initial purchase from that first year, this present value is declining. And that makes sense to us because if I'm willing to give you $1,000 today or $1,000 in eight years, when are you going to get more value out of that? Well, you're going to get more value out of that today, right? Whether you go buy something right now, you invest that money, you decide to do something else with it, whatever the case is, right? You got all these years less of inflation attached to that $1,000. There's a lot of reasons why but that $1,000 is going to be a lot more useful to you now than it will in eight or 10 years. So that's what we're seeing. As I get further and further out, that $4,100 is actually worth less and less. And in, in total, when I come down at the end of this asset's eight year life, I will see that I will generate $20,367 in discounted cash flows. You'll notice that's different than the overall $32,800 that I'm receiving in actual cash, right? The actual paper dollars that I receive in total 32.8, the value of that 32,800 though is only 20,367. But remember, we didn't get that 20,367 for free. We had to actually put some cash in on the front side in this initial investment. That initial investment was $16,000 and that $16,000 coming out of the 20,000 tells me that I will end up with a net present value in this case of $4,367. So in this case, my rule, whenever I'm looking for net present value is that if my net present value, in this case, the 4,367 is greater than zero, I will accept the project. I will pursue that task because it is actually beneficial to the organization. So net present value, we really like. And here we see that decision rule. So when an asset's expected future cash flows yield a positive, as we just saw, net present value and discount at the required rate of return, we will acquire the asset. So in this case, they tell us, we'll take the present value of the net cash flows minus the amount invested, and that gives me my net present value. At that point, if that number is greater than zero, you will invest. If it is not greater than zero, do not invest. So if it is negative, do not invest. So finally, when we are comparing several investment opportunities of similar cost and risk, you will want to pursue the project or pursue the task that has the highest level of positive net 
present value. So that is what we see here. Now, in truth, we can simplify this. So do you notice anything about this calculation we just did? What do we notice about that net cash flow each year? It's the same. Because I'm receiving the same amount of cash each year, this is what we actually call an annuity. And annuities are really nice because they simplify my life a whole heck of a lot. So in this case, what we will see is that we can actually simplify this present value calculation if there is a series of equal cash flows. This is a series of equal dollar amounts and then it's called an annuity. In this case, we will use table B.3 for the present value of $1 to be received for a number of periods. So in this case, we will go look at table B.3. We will find in that table that my present value factor for this case is 4.9676. At that point, I will take the $4,100 times that present value factor. That will give me the 20,367 that we calculated before, still coming out to the same 4,367 in net present value. Now, in this case, they're asking us to deal with net present value, looking at cash savings from automation. So in this case, they tell us increased automation from the use of robotics and computer numerical controlled machines will yield cash savings from reduced direct labor. If the present value of cash savings from reduced direct labor cost exceeds the cost of automated manufacturing, the company should automate its production process. So in years one through eight, we will save a total of $1.5 million in cash. This will occur with a present value, or I'm sorry, we will save the 1.5 million every year for the years one through eight. Well, at that point, we are discounting in this case at a rate of 10%. So my present value factor 6.1446 times my 1.5 million is 9,216,900. In this case, the initial investment required is only $8 million, giving me a positive net present value here of just over 1.2 million. Now, Net present value with uneven cash flows is a little bit more involved. It's a little bit more similar to what we saw right at the beginning of this. So in this case, we are told that we are looking at three different projects, project A, project B, and project C. In this case, we can see that project A has even cash flows of $5,000 each year over this project's life. Then we come in and we see that project B has is cash flows, but they're a lot more heavily weighted toward that front end of the project. And project C has the same $15,000 in cash over the life of the project, but it is much more heavily weighted toward the end of the project. So what we will notice is that for year one, my present value of dollar discounted at 10% is 0 0.9091. So we'll multiply that, of course, by each of those numbers. And for project A, that's 4546. For project B, is 7273. And for project C, it's only 909. And we come down the table doing this. Now, out of those three projects, before we even really complete the math, I think we can tell which project should have the highest net present value. So in each case, I'm using the same factor. And you'll notice that factor is declining as I get further and further away, meaning that the more heavily weighted I am toward the end, the less that dollar is actually worth. So project B, we would expect to have the highest level of net present value because it collects the most cash the quickest. And in fact, it does have the highest level of net present value. After that, I would expect project A, and in this case, that is correct. And then finally, I would expect project C to have my lowest level of net present value because the majority of its cash is collected in that last year with that lower present value factor. Giving me, in this case, positive present net present value for projects A and B, and an actual loss if I were to pursue project C. So if I'm only able to pick one of these, I am going to select project B as it has the highest net present value that is positive. Very good. Now, in truth, right, we can compare positive net present value projects just using net present value, and that's fine, um, but it's not really the right way to do this. So there really is a better way to do this, and that better way is with what we call the profitability index. So when I look at profitability index, it's going to actually help me decide which product or which project is the best to pursue. 
So in this case, we are using profitability index to compare projects when a company cannot fund all positive net present value projects. So this is essentially if I've got a limited budget. So I look at this, I say, okay, this is great. All of these projects generate positive net present value. I like that, but I don't have enough money to fund them all. So I can only pick the ones that are the most profitable relative to the amount of their investment. So profitability index will take the present value of my net cash flows divided by my initial investment. So for project one, we see we generated the highest level of net cash flows or the present value of net cash flows of 900, but we also see it requires a very large investment. Project two generates a much smaller present value of net cash flows, but requires a much smaller investment than of course project three. So we come down and we see here that in this case, project one will be my ranked or will be ranked second in this case, project two will be ranked first and of course project three would be ranked third. So this is what we see, right? If I'm only able to fund one of these, I'm going to start with project two because it generates the highest return relative to the amount of the initial investment. Then I would fund project one after that. And then finally, if I had enough cash, I would get around to funding project three. Now, in this case, right, project three, would indicate a problem though, because we do hit a profitability index of less than one. So in this case, I would actually ignore project three because it did not meet that standard. I right? had project three come in at 1.1 or even maybe at 1.0, right? Then it would be considered. Um, but the general rule here, right? We're ranking these things in order of profitability index, starting with the highest and then coming down through the list. So in this case, I would start with project two, then fund project one. And then if there was another profitable project, I would continue to go down the list. In this case, project three would generate a negative net present value though. So I will not actually be funding that. Now you say, well, this really is an idea then on capital rationing. So capital rationing generally takes the two types. There's a hard rationing, which is imposed by, for example, the bank. The bank won't loan any more money. And there's a soft rationing, right? For example, management might say your department can only spend X amount of money. Not because we don't have more money, but because that's all we want to allocate to that area, right? So there are these different types of capital rationing. Very good. And that is what we see here. So these capital rationing constraints, hard rationing, once again, imposed by external forces while soft rationing internally imposed by our own management. Now, our next area then is our internal rate of return. Internal rate of return, the actual calculation is pretty nightmarish and typically involves a lot of work in Excel. Um, but the idea here with internal rate of return is that this is the present value, um, or this is the interest rate that we'll make, my present value of those cash inflows minus my initial investment equal to zero. In other words, right, what we're really saying here is this is the interest rate that makes net present value equal to zero. This is my internal rate of return. So in this case, internal rate of return, projects with even annual cash flows, so project life of three years, initial cost of 12,000, annual net cash inflow of 5,000. The first thing we will have to do is to compute my present value factor for the investment project. So I will start by taking my initial cost of 12 divided by my annual net cash inflows of five. In this case, that gives me a factor of 2.4. I will then need to identify the discount rate that gives me that present value factor by going to my tables. So when I go look at my table, I'll see that for my three-year project, when I run into my 2.4, this is at approximately an internal rate of return of 12%, right? a discount rate of 12%. So we can get pretty close. The actual exact calculation here, right? If you actually want to know that that's 12 point blah, 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 blah or 11 point, blah, 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 whatever it is, that would generally need to be done in Excel. We can get pretty close with our tables, um, but we can't hit it exactly right every time because there's just not that level of detail with our tables that we have available to us in the textbook. But in this case, we would be able to say that my internal rate of return is right around 12 now, for uneven cash flows, um, this becomes well beyond what we're going to be doing in this class, 
In that case, you certainly will want to switch over to a finance calculator or something like Excel or AlterYX uh, to compute this. Um, however, we can also use trial and error. So you could get there eventually by just plugging in random numbers and trying this over and over and over and over and over again, but it would be very inefficient. Um, because of that, I'm not going to give you a question with uneven cash flows where I'm asking you to actually compute the exact answer here for internal rate of return. So internal rate of return, we use of course to evaluate our projects and we will compare that internal rate of return on the project to once again, that hurdle rate, that cost of capital. To be acceptable, a project's rate of return cannot be less than the company's cost of capital. So the idea here is we like NPV because it puts things in dollar terms, right? How many dollars is this? It's pretty easy to understand. Internal rate of return is essentially the same thing, but, but in percentages. So the reason internal rate of return sees a lot of use is because our management, our CEOs, our CFOs, those individuals running these companies like to see things in percentage terms. It's really the only reason. Otherwise, we could just stick to NPV. But because people like percentages, we do see this internal rate of return getting a lot of use. So here's all of my different um, budgeting methods that we've talked about, payback period, ARR, my NPV, and then my IRR. And you can see that each one measures um, based on something else. So payback period, NPV, and internal rate of return all look at cash flows, while the accounting rate of return looks at my accrual or my net income. You can see they're all based on different measurement units for the most part, other than my two rates. Those, of course, are both percentages. They all vary with their strengths and their limitations, and it's very important that you understand them. I think this exhibit 24.12 is a very important exhibit for you to be familiar with as you study for the exam, as this gives you a really good method of kind of seeing if you understand the general ideas of all of the different topics in this chapter. Now, at this point, a post audit, this will be what is considered the evaluation of a project's actual results versus what we projected. So after the thing is actually done, well, how do we line up to what we expected? So the same method used to support the capital budgeting should be used in the post audit. So if we said that we want to go with this project because of payback period, then we should evaluate it using payback period and not net present value, right? That wouldn't be fair to the project. Conversely, if I accepted the project because of NPV, I shouldn't then get upset that my payback period took a little bit longer than I expected, right? If that's not the yardstick that was used to measure it initially, that shouldn't be how we evaluate it at the end. Now, of course, the benefits here, management will be, or management will be more careful with the investment proposal that they actually submit and poor investments will be identified earlier and management can change their investment strategies. So the post audit, right? This doesn't really have to be completely at the end of the project's life. For example, if I'm investing in a 20 year project, I don't have to wait 20 years to do this post audit. I can start this process maybe a year or two in, see how it looks like we're doing and then see if we're pretty much on track with what we expected at that point, right? So I think this word post messes with people sometimes and they really get it in their head. This has to be at the very end. But if I wait 20 years to see how my investment did, that's not me running my business very successfully or very well. And so I probably don't want to do that. So very good. Now, this next idea is what is called break even time. This incorporates time value of money into the payback period method. So this is pretty good. Um, it's a big step up over just basic payback period. And what you're seeing here is that initial cash outflow went out today. So that present value of that dollar was a dollar, right? It was the full amount. And so that cash outflow hits at the full amount versus in this case, we come down and we were able to see that my uh, 4,100 in that first year, of course, being discounted for the one year that's gone by all the way down. And once again, in this case, we now have now bumped, right? Before we were between years four and five on that break even, and now we are between years five and six because of that additional piece. Now, this next area, I'm not going to cover really in this class. Um, I will go ahead and just flash it up here for you if you just wanna see how this kind of works in Excel. The textbook does go over this in a fair bit of detail in the appendix. Um, so if you're an accounting major, I never think it's a bad idea to learn more about Excel, learn how to do more things in Excel. 
even if you're a finance major, maybe in this case, um, because this chapter is so heavily involved in finance, I think getting into Excel, playing around with it, trying things out, learning how to use different functions in Excel, I think that's always a good idea. So this is where we're at, this is what we've got. And with that, we have officially hit the end of chapter 24. So at this point, that's really the end of the course. So if there is anything that you felt like we did really well this semester, or you felt like you really just didn't enjoy, I would ask that you go ahead and consider um, telling me that information in the evaluations that are available through your um, student portal on the website. So please make sure if you really enjoyed something, really didn't like something, you go ahead and tell me that, right? Um, because at the end of the day, I'm here to try to help you learn the material as best we can. And so if there are some improvements that I can make, I'm always happy to look into those different areas, look into different strategies um, to help you be successful. But I've had a great time with you all this semester. I hope you've all enjoyed the class. If you have any questions, once again, please never hesitate to reach out to me. I'm always happy to help you. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the class one more time, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you.